questions. I am Dr. Malia Jones. I'm a social infectious disease epidemiologist, nerd, and the former editor-in-chief here at Dear Pandemic. And I am super excited to be back with you. I'm thrilled to share that we are relaunching our live Q&As after a six-month hiatus. Thanks very much to Dr. Chana Davis, who is uh, here with me today, and she's going to be taking over as the, the lead host of our live Q&As. Dr. Davis is a geneticist and a super nerd, and uh, she's going to be carrying the Q&As forward from here. So take it away, Chana. Thanks so much, Malia. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm thrilled to be hosting this forum. I view this as a space to dig a little bit deeper and to share some of our personal perspective about how nerds like Malia and I actually tackle these decisions that are very relevant to our lives. And as a reminder, we don't take questions cold. The questions that we'll be discussing come from our inbox and we want to make sure that we have all the resources and links ready for you. You can always submit to our inbox and we'll include them in the questions that we survey to decide what we're going to tackle on any given Q&A session. And but I guess that's all I want to say for intro. So let's just get started because we have a lot we're going to be covering today from variants to boosters to rapid testing and vaccines for kids. Yeah, there so was a lot to started. pick from because it's been so long. I so yeah. I want to start off with this question because I know it is really relevant to you. Um, Jennifer in Texas asks, we had the Omicron variant and we were vaccinated. Do we still have to worry? Yes, this question is definitely up my alley. That is exactly the situation my family is in. So my husband and I are fully boosted. My kids have had uh, two shots and we all had Omicron. So my son had it right on Christmas day and the rest of us managed to escape, but then we all got it three weeks later. So this is something I've you know thought about a lot. And, you know, initially I was a little bit worried when BA2 started to emerge. But based on what we know now about a quite small risk of reinfection, I feel like we are in a low risk category right now. So we have what's called hybrid immunity, which means we have immunity both from vaccines and from natural infection. And importantly, that our natural infection comes from a relevant variant. Uh, in addition, our immunity from both of those sources is relatively fresh. So because we're in that situation, I'm not particularly worried about reinfection at that time, at, the, at this moment. But um, I know that immunity, both from vaccines and from natural infection, is sort of unpredictable in how long it's going to last. And so my level of worry is going to slowly ratchet up over time. Um, just to, since this question comes up a lot about what's the risk of reinfection with BA2 um, after having BA1, um, I'll say that there was a study that uh, they looked at almost 2 million infections and looked for reinfections. And they found about um, 1,800 reinfections in that population of 1.8 million. So that's about one in a thousand reinfection risk. Um, although, and that was reinfections within a short time window, right? So that yes, was within a yeah, couple months. Yeah, reinfections within a two month window. Thank you. Yeah. And of those reinfections, um, only 47 were BA1 followed by BA2. Right. So the uh, a majority of the infections were Delta followed by BA2 or, or, or another Omicron. And those reinfections often happened in young and unvaccinated individuals. So as a vaccinated individual, your risk is presumably lower. Now, this was not a perfectly, this is not like a randomized controlled trial. So you've got to take those exact numbers with a grain of salt. But just in general, we're not seeing a huge amount of reinfection um, following BA1. Right. Yeah, so I will put the link to um, that study in the chat here. Okay. Can, oh, I, I thought one more thing I wanted to add here is that, uh, as I mentioned, it's really important when you're considering your reinfection risk um, to consider what variant you previously had. Now, most of us don't know what variant we had for sure, but you can try to guess based on just the variant landscape at the time you were infected. So at some points in time, it's almost 100% of a single variant and other times right. it's more of a 50 50 split and so i actually you know being a super nerd of course i had to find my local public health dashboard and here in bc there is a dashboard they report weekly what the variant distribution is so you can go back and look they, they report about two weeks after the time so you go back and, and comb through all the reports and say what was the variant landscape at the time that i was infected and that just gives you a rough sense of probability 
So for in my case, when my son was infected at Christmas here in BC, it was between 90 and 95% Omicron. So it's very likely he had Omicron. By the time we were infected, it was over 95% Omicron. So it's pretty safe to say um, that we had Omicron, but you'd have to check your um, regional dashboard to get a sense of what you had. I know that in the US, there is a national tracker that also gives some regional breakdowns. And I, and I have a link for that. If anyone's interested, check out the variant proportions in the US. Yeah. Yeah, so as we see um, the new um, the new BA2 variant start to sweep in the United States, hopefully, you know, all those people who had Omicron 1 will not be at high risk for reinfection. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great. Uh, well, we thanks for this, that. We got those links dropped. Sorry, I think so. Yeah. Um, I don't see anything in the chat here. So I don't know if somebody can like wave to us, say hi, tell me it's working. That would be great. <laughs> oh, yeah, it yeah. is working. Good? Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, excellent. So may I ask you a question now, Malia? Of course. This is one of our hot topics. So what on earth is going on with fourth shots or second boosters? Yeah. Should I get one? So this is a question from Jazine and Alameda and many other uh, readers. Yeah. Um, so this second booster situation is um, kind of, it's a little messy. Uh, you should really see the back channeling we've been doing within Dear Pandemic as we've tried to figure out how to explain this clearly because there is actually a lot of lack of clarity here, both in the messaging and in the, in what we know. Um, and I think we may have even broken one of our newer contributors, Dr. Matson. She wrote a post about this on Thursday and it was really rough going. <laughs> so, but she did in the end, I think write a lovely post. Her big takeaway from it was the higher your risk of severe illness if you got COVID was the more you may benefit from getting another booster right now. Um, and I think it's also really important to note at the top that there are really, I think, very few downsides to getting another booster now. And I will talk a little bit more about this. Um, I like this way of framing it because it highlights that it's not a clear cut answer. It's not like, yes, you know, this exact group of people needs another booster. Um, we, we don't actually know that right now, uh, what group of people need it the most. Um, but I think, you know, thinking about it as a spectrum and thinking about your spectrum of risk and where you are on a spectrum of risk is helpful. So um, first, let me back up a little bit. I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. What we're talking about here is people who have had two doses of an mRNA vaccine originally, that's Moderna or Pfizer, and then got a booster dose. And it's been four or more months since the booster dose. Uh, CDC recently authorized a second booster dose. So that's shot number four for all people who are age 50 and older and people who are younger than that and are immunocompromised. Um, and we're getting just a lot of questions about like, do I really need this? Um, you know, what is the evidence here? So um, FDA and CDC, when they authorized this, they reviewed data from a couple of studies that came out of Israel where some people have been getting a fourth shot. Um, honestly, those data are not very clear, I think. Uh, from my read, who really benefits the most from another booster is, is unknown. Um, one study showed a really pretty modest reduction in symptomatic Omicron cases in a sample of healthcare workers, but there was no difference in, um, in, symptomatic, er, in severe disease between the control group and the, and the group that got a, another booster. And then another Israel study um, looked at fourth boosters in people who were uh, between ages 60 and 100, and they did find a reduced risk of death from COVID in people who got boosters, but it wasn't randomized. Um, so it's tough to make really strong conclusions about, you know, maybe it was, maybe it was actually lower risk people who got a fourth booster for some reason. So, um, you know, who needs it the most, I think is unclear. Um, what are the benefits of a, of a fourth dose? Um, well, your potential benefit is gonna be higher, the higher your risk from a COVID-19 infection is. And um, what we do know here is that the potential harm of taking another booster dose is really quite small. Uh, they are safe. There were no safety issues raised. Um, several million people in Israel have gotten a fourth dose and symptoms side effects were similar to the first booster. Um, so overall, you know, to kind of put a 
bow on it. As I see it, there are very few downsides of getting one if you're eligible. And personally, you know, from an epi perspective, I would rather, since we don't know who really needs one, I would rather cast a wider net and be sure to capture the people who really need one um, since the risks are so low, right? It's sort of like, why not? Um, however, I will say not everyone agrees with this. The uh, EU regulators, for example, are not recommending a fourth dose right now. And they're citing that there's no evidence that immunity is waning. Um, and so there's some, there's some, you know, it's up in the air. Do you know what it is in Canada? I think it's actually not far behind the U.S. There was actually okay. a woman at the pharmacy yesterday saying, do you know when the 50, I heard it's going to be over 50 now. Do you know when I can get mine? Yeah. So we don't have supply yet. So I think, I think we're kind of just uh, one stage behind you in terms of highest risk first and then opening up the right. risk levels. So I think right now there is enough info from those Israeli studies to suggest that people who are at higher risk for death from COVID-19 should get one. Um, it's definitely safe and it might be helpful. And, you know, as always, I would say, just talk to your clinician or your pharmacist if you're in doubt about this. And I'm going to put a link to Dr. Madsen's post about this um, just, just uh, yesterday, I think this was. Mm-hmm. We're working on another one for next week that's going to be a more in-depth review of what we know, um, or more accurately, what we don't know <laughs> about this. So yeah. you can watch for that in terms of the epi. And then the last thing I want to say before I quit talking about this is that if you haven't got your first booster yet, there is very strong evidence at this point that for your first booster is very important. So if you haven't got the first booster yet, go and get it. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of the studies looking at the fourth dose are, are, are trying to hammer home the point that they're usually comparing fourth dose against those who had a third dose already. So that already right. have considerable protection. And that's a higher bar than... Yes, it is a much higher bar. Doses. Exactly. That's yeah. a good point. But just to unpack a little bit what you said, that we don't know who benefits most. I think we we do know that those who are at a higher risk of severe COVID outcomes benefit more, but maybe we don't know at an individual level what your specific immunity is. Yes, exactly. Yeah, almost no one knows what their own yeah. levels of antibodies are. And actually, I don't think it's possible to know what your personal immunity is because Immunity is not just your antibodies. It's also what you're exposed to, what the variant is, how much virus you're exposed to for how long, if you're fighting another disease at the same time, you know, there's a lot to immunity. And so I don't think it's really possible for any of us to know what our own immunity level is. And so, yeah, you know, at the epidemiological level, um, it's clear that higher risk people, uh, at least some of them are going to benefit from a, another dose. Um, but we haven't been able to get real specific. And I don't think it's possible for like you or me or any other one person out there to really know for sure. Like, do I personally need this? Yeah. Well, I, I think an antibody response is one, one metric, but it doesn't stop the whole picture in, in your yeah. protection. Level. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, building on this, what's going on with J and J in terms of boosters and just in, in general protection? Yeah. Um, so we are, <laughs> I've been following this question a lot because um, as you know, I had J&J, so I've been tracking this. Um, what As data, as new information has emerged about J&J, it has become more and more clear that um, the mRNA, the two dose vaccines do offer better protection than J&J does. J&J is not a total failure. It offers pretty good protection, but it could be better, right? Um, J&J recipients definitely do need a booster. So there's really no question about that. Um, and, you know, just to cite some data on this, one U.S. study during Omicron found that deaths from COVID-19 among people who were unvaccinated were 10 times higher than among people who got Pfizer or Moderna. And deaths among J&J recipients were four times higher than among Pfizer and Moderna recipients. So it's not as bad as having no vaccine, for sure. Uh, it's also, it could be better. There's also some good new evidence that getting an mRNA vaccine booster for your J&J shot uh, can basically bring you up to speed, uh, up to the same level of protection as people who got two doses of mRNA in the first place. So the recommendation is to get an mRNA booster for your J&J um, vaccine. And if you already got two J&J vaccines, you're now eligible in the United States for an mRNA booster. So it's a little complex. I did, I wrote out all the different scenarios in a post about this this week. So I will 
drop that link in the chat right here. Okay. And if we're ready for one more, I, I know. Yeah, sure. I know there's tons okay. of booster. There's a couple in the chat too that I think are ones that we plan to address. So yeah, okay. let's do them. Let's talk about boosters and kids or just what we know at this point. Yep. Um, boosters and kids. So um, what is going on with these? Uh, Caitlin, let me see if this works. Oh yeah. Caitlin asks us, does anyone know when boosters will re be recommended for kids age to five to 11? So my kids are in this age group. I am wondering too. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have much to report. Kids who are age 12 and up can get a booster, including the ones who turn 12 since they got their first two shots. So if your kid was 11 mm. and they've since turned 12, they can get a booster. Um, also immunocompromised kids who are ages five to 11 can get a Pfizer booster once it's been five months since their second dose. Um, for the rest of us, for the rest of the five to 11s, we're just waiting for news. The vaccine was authorized for kids in this age group on October 29th in the United States. Uh, it will be five months from my kids' second shots on April 30th. So I'm just crossing my fingers that they authorize boosters for this group soon. And yeah, we'll let you know as soon as we hear anything. Yeah. Um, one other question related to uh, boosters that comes up a lot is what about sort of timing the market? You know, if you have a big yeah. European summer vacation, is that a bad idea to be boosting now and um, being less protected in, you know, three, four months? Potentially? Yes. Um, so this is a really hard question to answer because we can't tell the future, right? It's very hard to know what's coming next. Um, we don't know what's coming in the fall. You know, we think maybe this is going to turn into a seasonal kind of a thing. There may be a wave in the fall. Uh, we don't really know if there will be a new variant before then. There could be a new formulation of the vaccines before then that, ha you know, that's a variant specific. Um, and we also don't know how long your immunity boost would last from a fourth shot. So I will say this, um, don't put it off because you think it might be your last COVID shot. I don't think it will be. We, um, we don't know when variant specific boosters are coming, but we probably will have them. The FDA met yesterday to talk about this and how to plan for uh, the selection of variants and roll out variant specific booster shots like we have for influenza every year. When those are ready to roll, I would guess that everyone will be eligible for variant specific boosters, including people who get a fourth booster now. And, um, you know, it even seems like we could end up with a combo flu COVID vaccine ultimately that would be annual. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think you're, there's not like a future where you're missing a future booster. If you take one now, I don't think that's the case. Timing it to, you know, protect you during your, your big trip to Italy. That's harder to say. I don't know. <laughs> Hard to guess where the market is going, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for I, we we got to get you a crystal ball because I know we ask you a lot of these. Right, well, I have my magic eight ball right here. So okay. if you but you have okay. to phrase it as a yes or no question. Okay. <laughs> as a last <laughs> resort, we'll bust that out. All right. So I've got one for you okay. next. Um, do wait a minute. This is sec question three. Question two. Here we go. The new Omicron strain. How worried are we? Okay. Well, that one, as usual, is going to depend on kind of who's asking the question and what the situation is. But let me give a little background first. So BA1 versus BA2. So I, I hope a, a lot of you have heard or read by now that these are two subvariants of Omicron. So they're both in the Omicron family. Um, you can kind of think of them as siblings. They share around 30 mutations relative to the original strain. Uh, and BA2 has eight unique mutations that are not found in BA1, and BA1 has 13 mutations not found in BA, BA2. So it's like they're overlapping. They have some similarities, but they also have unique differences. And it's BA1 and versions of BA1 that were largely responsible for the winter surge in much of the world. And now BA2 is taken over and is the dominant strain in many of the places that already had BA1. So it's, it's officially taken over in the US, in Canada, um, parts of Europe and Asia are now dominated by BA2 version of Omicron. So in terms of what we know about BA2 versus BA1, I think the big difference is transmissibility that people are talking about, which is quite clear that it's even more um, easy, to, easy to spread to others. 
we don't see obvious differences in disease severity, at least between the two Omicrons. So bringing it to the question of worry, um, personally, I'm not too worried about B2, as I mentioned earlier, because I, my family and I all have fairly fresh hybrid immunity. None of us are immunocompromised. So it's a reasonable assumption that we are well protected against BA2 for the time being. Um, but if I hadn't had Omicron relatively recently and I didn't have hybrid immunity, I would definitely be worried. The risk of BA2 um, would is high in a lot of places, even if the case counts might not look high. Case counts are not really that reliable anymore in much of the world, it's like the US where, where people are testing at home, it's not being reported. So I would, I just, you know, where I am right now, I would assume that there's a lot of, you know, potential risk of BA2 uh, circulating in my community in much, in many places in the world. So again, if I hadn't had Omicron and the vaccine, I would, yeah, you know, I would consider myself at risk of infection. Yeah, and, we just, you know, um, you know, for go ahead. a little uh, color, we somehow managed to not get Omicron and um, I'm still wearing a mask everywhere because I agree with you. I, I think my risk of getting one of the Omicrons is still quite high. Yeah. And, you know, people keep, it's like people keep learning all over again that mild does not mean a cakewalk. And I, you know, I just had a friend posting on Facebook the other day. It's like, why do people keep calling this mild? I just got it. And I feel horrible. I haven't felt this bad in 20 years. You know, he's not in the hospital, but he's still not enjoying himself and kind of wishing that this weren't happening. Um, and of course, what I worried about most is actually the long-term effects. And so I feel, I feel a great sense of relief that we haven't had long-term effects in my family, but it is remarkably common how even a mild case can end up with longer term, whether it's fatigue, brain fog, um, uh, other mysterious things like tachycardia, heart rate, um, arrhythmia. There's so many symptoms that linger for a reasonable proportion of the population in the long term. And, and as a, there's a science communicator called Raven, the science maven that I like that just put out a YouTube video describing her experience. And, you know, she was my yeah. age group, healthy, and is very much um, it's really life has been affected in a big way by this and several yeah. months later. So, and, you know, now it's that it's been thing. two years, sorry to interrupt you. I was yeah. just going to say now that it's been two years, we've had time to see what kind of other chronic illnesses are higher in yes. COVID survivors. And there actually are some pretty scary um, effects on heart disease rates, um, stroke risk, cognitive decline. There's quite a bit going on with people who, you know, got COVID and recovered and, and then have higher risk of a lot of other stuff. Yeah. So if I'm not a big fan of the get it over with kind of uh, mindset that even though having had it, I have to admit it's a huge relief. It's like, well, it's, it's a relief part, part of, partly because I was anxious about how bad is it going to be when we get it because it's such a wild card, right? I mean, most likely it'll be mild, but right. you know, my, my whole family experienced a spectrum of, of severity. So it's, it is kind of relief when you went through it. Although sometimes when you get through it, you're feeling really horrible and um, kind of looking back at uh, what you might what could have done differently. Yeah. So, um, but just stepping back in terms of, I, I think there's probably also an implied question here about, you know, is there going to be a surge? Is there going to be lockdowns? And all of that just depends. Is a, a impossible, surges are A, impossible to predict because we've learned that over and over again. And B, um, their, the public health response varies a lot from country to country. You know, you could, so one country may have a surge and the government doesn't respond with the lockdown. Another may have a surge and they do respond. So um, that's, really hard to predict and that that varies regionally, but it is interesting. And I think there's a lot of people perplexed by why we're not seeing a huge, a huge surge in the U S with B2. Yeah. And yet we are um, seeing that and seeing upticks in hospitalizations in other parts of the world. Yeah. And particularly the UK is um, yeah. it's really, really a mess over there uh, with yeah. BA2, even though it was also a mess with BA1. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So just in terms of, you know, just, we're just really speculating in terms of how it's going to happen. But some of the factors that matter are, you know, what's the immunity of the population, both what's their exposure to BA1 and protection, like people are talking about an immunity wall that the U.S. may have from all their Omicron cases. And then there's the vaccination, especially in vulnerable people. That makes a huge impact on how the mortality plays out. And there's some pretty striking graphs um, things in the Financial Times showing, you know, New Zealand versus Hong Kong in Hong Kong, a lot of the elderly population has a lower vaccination rate and the mortality rate from Omicron is really quite staggering. 
um, but for the same number of cases, playing out very differently in the healthcare system in a New Zealand with a high vaccination rate, especially in vulnerable populations versus Hong Kong. Right. So there is some concern in the U.S. that the um, adults um, that adults are not as boosted as we would like them to be to to sort of say that if we do get a big surge, the mortality won't be as as big as it could be. Then that's the yeah. discussion on that. Yeah, and I have no special insight into um, you know FDA's process for approving that fourth booster, but my guess is that that's what's you know that that's kind of what's going on here is like let's get that most vulnerable population as covered as we can get them, and at least avoid the worst of another surge when it does come. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, I don't have a crystal ball either, but uh, so it's, it's the answer is going to vary a lot regionally, and based on your personal situation and, and you know risk profile. Yeah. So I put the link in here um, to a, a article in the conversation um, that's about BA2 and how worried we are. Um, but since we're talking about variants, I've got another one for you about variants. And this, I know this is Shauna's specialty. She just loves these testing <laughs> questions. Thank goodness, because I don't know if anyone else does. <laughs> so the question is, do rapid tests detect Omicron and what about other variants? And this is a question from John in Pennsylvania. Okay. Yes, I do love rapid testing questions. I used to work in the diagnostics um, field, so I get excited when I get to go back to my home turf. So the short answer is yes, the rapid tests do detect variants, but their performance has to be reevaluated with every variant because the performance is not identical. So they, they, in general, they work, but there are subtle differences. And the important difference is what we've usually been seeing with different variants is that it's sensitivity that takes a hit. So that means there's a higher risk of a false negative. In other words, there's a higher risk that you take the test, you actually have it, but the test is negative. So we just have to, it's really important to bear in mind that, again, they work, but um, they can also miss it. And the best way to protect against that is to do repeat tests. So never assume that one rapid test is all you need and that's your definitive answer. You need to test repeatedly, ideally daily from let's say um, three days after exposure for maybe another four days um, exposure or symptoms. You wanna test for another three, four days after that. You know, and there are still, there will be some cases where it actually never turns positive. Um, even people who have symptoms and it's just like, it's a smoking gun. It's like, they must have it. Why are they not testing positive? That does happen. It's not super common. Like in my family, everyone tested positive, all five of us. Um, and we, we were very stereotypical cases. And then, you know, my other friend didn't pass positive for the first four days. Then she was positive on day six. It's like, they're, it's hard to predict in general, they're catching maybe half to three quarters of the cases in the expected time window, but there's going to be those random ones that, that don't test positive. So you kind of have to consider the big picture of like a, um, a family member right now. It's like they knew they had an exposure. They had a fever three days later. The test is negative. Well, I think it's a test. I think that's probably a false negative. And in fact, right. I think it was my brother and I, and I had a wager with him. But um, so I'm, I was so annoyed, by the way, with the rapid test because they kept turning negative. I was like, I betting you anything, she will be positive tomorrow or the next day. And so we made a wager and she did not turn positive. Ugh. And then, but then her sister turned positive and the mom I mean, turned positive. I'm like, well, it's very obvious that she got it and she gave it to her sister right. and her mom, but she's not testing positive. So again, that does happen. Didn't you have a name? Like, years. wasn't there some kind of a shorthand for this? The, I think we call them the untestables or something. The untestables. Right? Yeah. Or the undetectables yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Undetectables. That's a good one. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that was the name. So there are these mysterious undetectable cases, which, is probably a case of, um, for whatever reason, the virus isn't localizing very much in their nose. Right. Uh, they did they did a couple of throat swabs with her too, but you know the virus is not just in your nose. That's just where your re the readout is coming from. Right. So it's all contingent on how much virus is on that swab. And timing right. is a big factor because the viral load starts high, then it goes up, and then it goes down again. Um, but also just the sampling, right? Um, and and since, that, since, as you've alluded to, I love nerding out about this, I'll just explain a bit like how this works. And so a rapid test is really, really like a 3D physical interaction. And I liked like between your test is kind of looking for something that fits perfectly in that pocket, the viral protein. Um, and think about it like a Cinderella slipper. It has to fit perfectly to light up. But if it doesn't fit quite right, you know, like Steph's sister is like wedging her foot in there. You could kind of get it in there if it's not exactly the right fit. And um, so the key question when you're talking about variants, so these tests were all designed for the original strain. 
And if the variant has a slightly altered, you know, foot going in that shoe, um, it kind of depends on exactly how the foot is altered. And in the case of um, in case of the Omicron variant, the protein you're detecting, in, in most cases, it's called the nucleocapsid protein. So it's funny because people are always talking about how many spike protein mutations, but I care about nucleocapsid protein mutations because the nucleocapsid protein is the one that is used in rapid tests, usually not the That's spike protein. That's what the, tests, the rapid tests are detecting, yeah. Yeah. So I'm always looking at, well, how many mutations are in the protein that they're looking at in the rapid test? And so for the um, original Omicron BA1 strain, it was four mutations different than the original in that detected protein. And the BA2 is five, pro five mutations different, but it depends a lot where exactly those mutations are. And what you see is that um, since every test has a slightly different kind of glass slipper, it depends on the brand. And so I mm. actually recommend trying more than one brand because it takes so long to do all the really rigorous testing of to know the exact performance of each brand um, that you might as well just try more than one brand because then the chances that you miss it are lower if you have yeah. that possibility. Hmm. Anyways. Yeah. Um, uh, fascinating. Yes. Do you know if they're working on updating the tests for new variants as well? Or uh, Yeah. Uh, to, I know we, we don't ask questions. Cold. That like was a cold it, question. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's such a moving target. Like if, if we knew we had one that was going to be around for a long time, maybe would, I don't know if it would be worth it, you know, given that it's sort mm -hmm. of good enough and you can kind of get over it by testing more than once. Right. Yeah. What we've been but, doing but, in my family is um, we have several different brands of tests laying around and just cause we buy what's available. And then, you know, if I, when we've gotten a cold, we all get it. Right. So I just test all four of us and then I have four mm -hmm. different four different tests that does reduce your chances of, um, of ending up yes. with, you know, a false negative for one. Exactly. Right? So if we had exactly. three positives and a negative, I would assume that everyone had the same thing. Exactly. I think one thing you can do is kind of um, design a more generalized one, just like you can design like a generalized vaccine against multiple different versions. So maybe they would make it more, they wouldn't make one mm -hmm. kind of specific, but maybe more generalizable. Right. Make that slipper a little bit uh, more of a universal a fit. Squishy material. Yeah. Universal <laughs> fit. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's, uh, I think we're moving on to closing out here. Um, oh, yes. The topic, the topic that all the parents, uh, little ones are wondering about what the heck is going on with vaccines for kids under five. Oh, my God. Right. <laughs> so what the heck? Well, unfortunately, we don't have much new to report today, but I'm going to give you the latest update because I know everybody is wondering about this. Um, there are two vaccines on the horizon for kids who are younger than age five, and those are from Pfizer and Moderna. Um, I'm talking about in the United States. In other places, actually, we there are some uh, other vaccines that are being used in younger age groups. So in the U.S., uh, Let's talk about Pfizer first. So what happened with Pfizer, they fielded a trial of a vaccine for kids who are ages six months through four years. And that dose, it was a 10th of the adult dose. So it was quite, I mean, and the adult dose is already a very tiny amount of, of, uh, of medication. So it's a really, really small dose. Unfortunately, they announced in December that the, their results were disappointing. Uh, it did not generate the antibody response that they were hoping for. So they went back to their study volunteers with a third dose to see if that would bring the antibodies up to uh, where we where uh, th we think they'd be protective. Then in February, the FDA made this really surprising move. Um, they asked Pfizer to submit an application for an emergency use authorization anyway, without the results of that third dose. Um, and many vaccine experts, including me, thought this was not likely to go very well considering uh, there's at least one member of the FDA who has pushed back pretty hard on the whole idea of kids vaccines. Um, you know, I didn't see how, how is a vaccine that can't pr to prove any potential benefit going to be authorized. Um, and then, you know, if it did go through, would people want to get it? This is a vaccine uptake for kids is horrible already. I just couldn't see how we were going to message a vaccine that hasn't even been shown to work. Right. So maybe somebody at the FDA had the same concerns, or maybe they actually saw the data and realized it really wasn't borderline. It was not good enough and or something. We don't know. A week later, FDA canceled that meeting. They did a total 180. They um, canceled the meeting to review the data without the third dose. So 
now we're back to where we were in December with Pfizer. We're waiting for them to finish up that trial with the third dose of vaccine and see if it worked. Um, Pfizer and the FDA have both said that they expect those data to be complete in early April, which hmm, it is early April right now. So hopefully it's going to be any day now that we hear whether this third dose with the Pfizer vaccine worked. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. And if they do I move forward add, with I, it, sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to emphasize again. I think it's just easy to assume it's a safety issue whenever things don't move forward, but just, yeah. There was no sign at any point of a safety issue. It was really about the potential benefit and getting the antibody levels up. And really interestingly, the antibody levels were okay for the six month through 23 month participants, yeah. but, but too low for the um, two year olds to four year olds. So like I, nobody, you know, nobody's explained that yet. We haven't seen the full data yet because it hasn't been submitted to the FDA. So we're waiting for that. Um, if they do move forward, you know, it will be, it will be a three dose vaccine and it'll take some months before it uh, comes to, is reviewed by FDA and comes to market. But yeah, it's a great point, Jonathan. There was, there never has been any, um, safety issue. In fact, the kids in the trial, uh, they reported did great. So, um, okay. So that's Pfizer. I'm going to drop, yeah. <laughs> drop a link to the Pfizer stuff there. Moderna. All right. So two weeks ago, Moderna reported in a press release that their kids vaccine trial produced very good immune response and safety for their vaccine for kids ages six months through five years. Um, their vaccine the dose was a quarter of what adults receive uh, and it's two doses, 28 days apart. And they said two weeks ago that they are moving forward with an application for their vaccine um, to regulatory bodies around the world, including here in the US. And um, as a side note, they are also applying for authorization at the same time for their kids vaccine for ages six through 17 in the US. Um, those age groups are actually already approved in some other places around the world. So um, it's, I think it's no surprise just as an aside that these two companies ended up in different places in terms of their kids vaccine. They took really a different approaches to the study design for testing a kid's vaccine that required different timelines. So they started off on quite different timeline timelines. Pfizer used an age tier design that allowed them to roll out consecutive and apply for consecutive age group vaccines faster. And that worked for the, um, for the five to 11 group, but it backfired for this younger group because they didn't see the results that they wanted. Moderna took more time at the outset to dial in the dose um, and for all the age groups at once. And so that's why we are going to end up seeing the Moderna vaccine for ages six months through age 17 all at once, where mm -hmm. Pfizer is doing it sort of in a staggered approach. Okay, so when? Everybody just wants to know when. Um, <laughs> summer? We're hoping early summer. Moderna has estimated uh, that if all goes well with their review at the FDA, that um, they could be hitting the market in early summer. So, you know, all we have so far is a press release. FDA has not met about this yet. What they reported in the press release looked really promising. So I am hopeful that Moderna will become available for kids. And we're just going to have to wait and see on Pfizer. All right. Thank you for the update. Yeah. It's so hard for, for families with young kids. Um, I, my kids are, my youngest are six. And they were, so I guess they were, yeah, they turned six recently. So they were, they were just made the cut for yeah. not being in that limbo land for so long. Yeah, for sure. I know people are feeling like their kids are just going to age into the vaccine at some point. Yeah, I have a couple of um, I have a couple of quickie questions here okay. uh, that maybe we can tackle before we log off because they're related to the stuff I know we looked up before um, mm -hmm. before we started. So here's one from Karen who wants to know: Is there any advantage or disadvantage to mixing mRNA vaccines for that second booster? Pfizer for the first three and worst side effects each time. So wondering if Moderna would give you better coverage. Um, do you have an opinion on this, Chana? I, I have I, well, an opinion. I but... actually, I'm a quad. I just like, I'm all about mixing and matching. So I yeah. got AstraZeneca first um, just because it was the first available. And then for my um, second shot, it's, it was start, at that point, it was starting to be clear that mRNA was um, a safer choice and possibly a more effective choice. So I got... Um, Moderna second, that wasn't a choice. But then for my booster, 
I actually chose to get Pfizer just out of figuring to like cover your bases, tickle it in different ways. Yeah. Mindset with you know, early encouraging data. Yeah. And a lot of the people who do, you know, um, microbiology and virologists and uh, have, have said that they kind of, they feel like it might be slightly better to get to mix up your different doses. Um, Moderna boosters and Pfizer boosters are also different um, dose volumes. And so mm -hmm. if you've got um, worse side effects each time with Pfizer, you might see something different with Moderna. It's a little hard to predict, but it is a different dose. So, yeah. So I don't think we have like a, a study to point to, but it seems like this, that's the instinct of people in the field. Yeah. And I do think there is some really clear evidence for people who got J&J &J or AstraZeneca first. Yeah. It, it is better to get an a, a mRNA booster for those. Um, yeah. yeah. There's some real clear evidence of that. Um, and then we've got a couple here questions in the chat about um, vaccines and uh, variant specific vaccines, which oh. I can answer. Are the UK vaccines updated to protect against Omicron? No, as far as I know, there is no vaccine on the market that's updated to prevent, uh, to protect against a specific variant at this point. But I will say there there is also no evidence that it's really needed so far. Um, the vaccines we have um, are still protecting really very well against hospitalization and death, which is what they were designed to do. And so, no, not yet. I know uh, all the companies are working on this and it is likely to come along at some point in the future. But I, I also don't think that uh, there's good evidence that it matters so far. So um, yeah, that's I a mean, quick I think answer the, the thing one. is we saw, we saw such good protection against infection early on or symptomatic disease that it's hard to let go of that as the goal even though yes. it wasn't truly the goal. <clears throat> yes. And, you know, I think um, that's a higher bar as the variants get more contagious. So with Omicron, it's actually a lot hard, harder to protect against symptomatic disease because it is more contagious. All right. And then here's one more for you, Chana. How worried about new variant when traveling? Well, it depends a lot on your situation. So if you have fresh hybrid immunity and you've already had Omicron and you've had vaccines, I, I just took a tri trip over spring break and I didn't really worry much at all. I, guess it, I think it's very unlikely to get reinfected a short time after you had the similar variant. Yeah. If you haven't had it, then I would definitely be worried while you're traveling because you just don't know this with the love exposure and it's just hard to control the whole situation as much when you're traveling. Yeah, agreed. All right. Those are all the ones I saw that were related to okay. what we're talking about. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. If you want more from Dear Pandemic, you can check out their website or um, dearpandemic.com.org. Dot, dot dot um, it's .org, but I think .com is the directs there. Okay. <laughs> And we're also, you know, at, at Dear Pandemic on various social platforms, wherever you found us today, as well as um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, uh, we're everywhere. And um, I highly recommend checking out our newsletter because then it comes to you and you don't have to seek it out. So if you go to the website, you can sign up for the newsletter. And if I may plug myself, I'm at Field by Sites. You can find me on social at Field by Sites on pretty much all the same platforms. Great. Well, thanks very much. And thanks for taking over the Q&A's, Chana. Yeah. And if you have a question for us, please send it to us. Um, we do read all your questions. We don't answer everyone one at a time, but we read them all and they shape our daily posts and they shape our Q and A's. So keep them coming. Stay safe and stay sane. Thank you.